Hello everybody and welcome to this lesson from Ms Duckworth's Classroom. Today we'll be going through some drama analysis skills and we'll be looking at how you can comment on dialogue in detail. So a question I get asked quite a lot is how much can I really say about dialogue? What is there that I can really say about somebody speaking in a play? Um, and my answer to this question is lots. There is so much that you can say about dialogue. Um, in my last lesson I looked at how you can talk about dialogue when paired with stage directions and that will always be the case. Um, you can always try and look at stage directions as a way of interpreting dialogue further but today we'll just look at dialogue and try and think about as many different ways in which um, we can comment on dialogue. So today we're going to look at what dialogue can reveal about relationships between characters, the character motivations, um, learning more about characters, feelings and emotions and status and hierarchy. So what can you comment on? So I've tried to compile a list of all the things that I find myself um, commonly commenting on um, as a teacher but also what I try and um, foster within my classroom. So this is a list of all the different things that I find myself and my classes talking about on a regular basis. So word choice, so the, the words that are used um, in pieces of dialogue. So what has the playwright chosen for that character to say? What kinds of words do they use and why? Interruptions. Interruptions are massively important. Remember that this is not natural speech. This is planned. It's been written by somebody. So whenever there is an interruption, it is there for a reason. What does it show about the person who's being interrupted? What does it show about the person who is interrupting? How does that interruption change the course of um, that particular act? How does it change the relationships? How does it develop a character? Unfinished sentences. Why may a character not finish what they're saying? It could be for multiple different reasons. And um, as with all of these, you will look at the context of, of the extract, the context of the dialogue that you are looking at. Hesitations and pauses. Who is hesitating? Who is pausing? Why? Why at that particular moment? What's happening? Who are they talking to? What are they talking about? What's happened before? What is it leading up to? Mirroring and repetition. So this is when characters mirror each other. So this could be through repeating words and phrases, repeating the structure. So sometimes you can have parallel structure in terms of um, the phrasing. Um, and the repetition of characters repeating words several times or characters repeating each other's words. Um, sometimes you have multiple characters sharing and repeating each other's vocabulary. The length of speech. So how long somebody speaks for and if this is consistent. Um, so do they speak constantly one line, one line, one line or do they dominate the conversation? Are these characters that speak um, for quite a long period of time and other characters maybe have more minor pieces of dialogue. The frequency, how often does a character speak? Um, does this change? Is this static? Is, does this tell you something about their relationship? Does this tell you something about their status within this particular scene or within the play? Any notable patterns that you can that you can see? Does one character ask a lot of questions? Does one character repeat a lot of what other people say? Um, so what do you notice from the patterns? First of all you have to identify them and then you think about what you learn and what they reveal. And then if you do notice a pattern, then if there's any changes in the speech pattern. So do you notice um, that a pattern changes at a certain point in the play and then goes back to what it was previously? Or does it change um, and then it doesn't really go back to how it was to begin with? Does that then show you something about character development? Okay, so I will go through two examples here just to model for you the ways in which you can use that list to identify and then comment on um, different aspects of dialogue. So the examples that I'm going to use are The Crucible and Othello, which are both IGCSE texts, but again, um, as in lesson one, um, these are, um, are generic skills. They can be applied to absolutely any play that you are studying. Um, I'm just using these um, as an example. Okay, so the context of this particular extract from The Crucible, it's the end of Act 1. Reverend Hale is questioning Tichuba about her involvement in witchcraft. Tichuba has been brought by Paris um, to work for him from um, Barbados, and so she is effectively um, his slave, so that's a little bit of the context of the, the whole play. 
Um, and this is moving towards the climax, the end of Act 1, um, where Tichuba and the other girls are being questioned. Now, because um, of Tichuba's um, position within the social hierarchy, um, it's important that we look at status and hierarchy as well. Um, and we try and look for patterns in terms of um, how is her position reinforced through the dialogue. So same as with lesson one, we're looking for what stands out, um, what does it show? Once you've identified things that stand out, what, what do you learn here? What does it show you about the characters, about their relationships, about their positions? How is it shown to you? And that's where we go back to the list that I just showed you. Is it through hesitations? Is it through questions? Is it through repetition? And then you always want to ask yourself, why does Miller do this? Now, you will always be linking everything back to what you already know. Um, either contextually, what you know about the context of the play, or what you know about the characters already, what has already been established. Okay, so these are the um, examples that I pulled out. So I'll just talk you through um, the different things that I noticed and what you can then say about them. So there's obviously, there's quite a lot here, which like I said at the beginning, there is lots and lots that you can say um, about dialogue. You don't have to talk about everything. Um, you don't have to just go through and highlight as much as you can. Um, but you, you pick what you think is relevant to your task, your question, your activity, um, and then you, you pull out those examples and then you try and say as much as you can about them. So first of all, just my overall reflections on this extract. So what stands out? So as I was reading back through it, what initially stood out was Tichuba's fear and desperation. Um, her low status is definitely reinforced throughout this extract. The power of Reverend Hale, but also the power of others, they come in towards the end. What does all of this show? It shows that she does have this inferior position, but it also shows the power of persuasion especially to somebody within her position when she's being questioned and interrogated by those who are um, socially superior. How does Miller present this to us? So this is where we're now going to think about the methods, the techniques. So there's repeated question structure, repetition of words and phrases, religious language, pauses and imperatives. So you'll notice that these are all from the list that I gave you to begin with. Um, so religious language and imperatives, these are all to do with word choice as well. So you try and think about what words are chosen, why are they chosen, um, what job do they do here. And then why does Miller do all of these different things at this particular point in Act 1? So he wants to show you the treatment of those in the lower ranks of society. He wants to show you the danger of succumbing to fear and hysteria, which is what happens here. You, get, you see the tension rising and building. He wants to show you um, how blame manifests itself, try to show how easy it is to succumb to suggestion, which is what happens to Tichuba towards the end of this extract, and also to show the contrast between these ideas of good and evil. So the context of the Crucible, um, it's a Puritan society, so it's very, very religious, and so we, we have this contrast within this extract between God and the devil, and good and evil, and we see kind of how that's used against Tichuba. It's used to, to persuade her um, to give her testimony, to accuse other people. It's, it's, it makes her scared, it creates fear as well, and it also reminds her what she should be saying um, in by, in, by way of using religion and God, the light of the Lord. Okay, so we'll just go through a few of these examples. So the first thing that I picked out here was word choice, which is here. Tichuba, look, come look. So we have imperatives by Reverend Hale. And he is a reverend as well, so um, in a religious society, he, he obviously has quite a superior position. Now the imperatives paired with the repeated questions, so he uses the questions quite a lot, shows that he is quite dominant. In addition, he uses her first name, whereas she calls him Sir, so you notice here, when she's speaking to him, she calls him sir. So again, the choice to use Tichuba, the choice to use sir, the choice to use imperatives, the choice to use questions, all these show you something. And that's really what you're doing. You're looking at the choices made by the playwright and you're asking yourselves why have they been used and what do they reveal to me about characters, relationships, status and hierarchy. So then we have repetition. Tichuba repeats and rephrases Hale's questions shows that she's taking the lead from him um, and this is the way that she can help to save herself 
whether or not she really believes this, she needs to save herself in some way. She's been put on the spot here, she's been interrogated. The blame is lying with her at this moment. So he says, you love these little children. And she says, oh yes, sir, I don't desire to hurt little children. You love God, I love God. So she just rephrases and repeats the questions that he poses. Um, she's trying to align herself with him here, trying to align herself with the good side, not the evil side. Um, and then if we move down, we have Hale using this prayer. Um, he's reciting, it's almost like a prayer that he's reciting, almost like he is working towards saving her soul. This is her salvation. And it's for her to repeat, um, suggest that maybe he is her salvation or following him is her salvation. And this is actually quite manipulative because as we get towards the end of this short extract, um, Hale takes a bit of a step back and the other characters come in and it turns from this a lot of this religious language to now very accusatory in terms of did you see this person, did you see that person, was it Sarah Good, was it, was it Goody Osborne? Um, so it's almost like he does this for a pur purpose to get her to a particular point and then the others come in and they start to, there's a barrage of questions from them as well. Um, so we've got in God's holy name, bless him, bless him, unto his glory, eternal glory. So she repeats him again and then she repeats bless him. So this is like her prayer. This is her, her trying to save herself. And then we come back to these imperatives that we started off with. And it, he's reminding her of his dominance here and that he is her salvation. And all she really needs to do is follow his instruction. Um, so again, the word choice, but also the relig religious language here of salvation. He's offering her salvation. Let God's holy light shine on you. And then we have the introduction of the devil at this point. So we've gone back to, to word choice. So the devil and this religious imagery is introduced here at the, this point. So he says, when the devil comes to you, does he ever come with another person? Now he pairs this with a question. Um, and again, it's very manipulative and it's, it's down to this said over here about the power of suggestion and how easy it is to succumb, to succumb to this, especially for somebody like Tichiba, who is desperate. She's at the bottom of this hierarchy. She's desperate to save herself because she knows what will happen if people feel that she is guilty of witchcraft and she's led these young girls astray. Um, so the introduction of the devil at this point, after the build-up of God's image, so we have God's holy light, God's holy name, um, it's persuasive, it's manipulative, and it shows that God's the, the property of God here to, to be the salvation. And then we have this succession of questions from the others. So Hale stops here and the others come in. And like I said, oh, it's a barrage. It's question, question, question. You can see they're all, they're all in blue. So it's no longer just Hale's domain. He's come in with the religion to, to scare her, to to make her feel that she she potentially is at risk of damning her soul and her reputation even. Now they're eager and the questions are very, very leading. This is where they begin to almost put words in her mouth um, and it, she does succumb to this and it's due to the fear that she feels. So who came with him? Sarah Good? Did you see him with Sarah Good or Osborne? Was it a man or was it a woman? And then we have Tichipa's question here, this is her first question, but it's rhetorical. She's not asking a question to them. She doesn't have the power to ask the question. She is not in that position. So the dialogue here in terms of the questions, that there is a, a pattern. They ask the questions. Those that are in power ask the questions. And when she does ask a question, it's to herself. She's giving herself time to think. She's giving herself time to save herself. Was it man or woman? She asks, man or woman? Was woman? So she takes takes the lead from them. And her response, she repeats. And as this continues, that's what happens. She repeats a lot of the suggestions that they give to her. Um, so she's considering both the question and her answer. And that also is, is evident through the pause here. So like I said to you, when we looked at the initial list, pauses, hesitations, they're very important. Her pause here shows that she is considering what she can say here in this situation. Um, and she repeats, she repeats what they say, reveals what they want to hear. She is merely a reflection of what they want to hear. That's her role here. She reflects back to them ultimately what they want. They don't necessarily want the truth. They want their version of the truth, which is where this is all leading. 
And let's have a look at example two. So example two is from Othello. Um, the context of this is it's from the end of Act 3, Scene 3. And this is where Iago continues his manipulation of Othello. He describes this imaginary um, dream or he, this behaviour that Cassio engaged in while he was asleep. So he says that he, he was a witness to Cassio's behaviour as he was sleeping. So again, we're going to go through these questions. So what stands out? What does it show? And why does Shakespeare do this? So what you could probably do at this point to try and, you know, practice a little bit is even if you've not read this play, um, just read through this. This is a little bit short and think, what would you pick out? What stands out for you in terms of the dialogue? Think about the list that we began with. Think about what I've just shown you, for example, one. And then see if you picked out similar things that I picked out. So if you want to just engage in that activity, just, just pause the video now and just see what would you pick out. Okay, so these are the examples um, of what we can say in terms of the dialogue. Now, what stands out, so really what stands out is Othello's emotion. That's quite evident all the way through and it's contrasted with Iago's calm, controlled demeanour. And um, what that does show is that Othello is succumbing to Iago's manipulation by becoming more emotional. Um, by changing the the way in which we've seen Othello throughout throughout the play. How do we know that he's succumbing to Iago's manipulation? Through the length of speech, through the interruptions, the hesitations, the repetitions, the aggressive interjections and the emotion that we see throughout all of these different things. So why does Shakespeare do this? Shakespeare's trying to show you here how Iago continues to dominate Othello and he becomes more powerful also shows that Othello is slowly unravelling. He's filled with rage um, and we can compare this to his earlier self-assurance and the, the way in which he behaves in his role. Okay, so first of all, um, if we think about the length of speech, and this is, uh, this is what I mean when I talk about length of speech, how long each character speaks for. So what you do notice is that Iago does dominate the speech. Just If you just look at it, what will stand out is he has more lines. So when he speaks, he speaks for a longer period of time. So Othello is one line, one line, one line, one line, one line, short line, half a line here, he doesn't even finish this. Um, so Iago dominates the speech. You know this because he speaks for longer when it is his turn to speak. Um, and it does show that he's got control over Othello. He is the voice that is listened to here also shows Othello's emotion is that he's unable to really develop his ideas. He, he's merely responding to what Iago is telling him and sometimes, like we have done here, he doesn't even finish his sentences. Here we see that the roles are reversed. Iago is the powerful, dominant one and he continues to de develop in this role. So we have aggressive language here, so again we think about word choice. So he says, I'll tear her all to pieces shows that he's responsive to Iago's manipulation. It's working what Iago is doing. Also shows the depth of his emotion, how upset he is by this. Again, we have questions here like we had in, in the example that we just looked at, but they're different kinds of questions. These questions steer the conversation. He's asking a question about the handkerchief. He says, tell me about this. Have you not yet, have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? Um, it's quite a, it's a contrived question, he knows the answer already, um, but he this symbol of the handkerchief repeats all the way through the play and Iago uses it here to have power over Othello. So he already knows the answer to this question, yet he asks it anyway because he's drawing Othello in, he's steering the conversation, he's got power over Othello's reactions, he's got power over the where this conversation is going. And then what you notice here is we have these, we have these pauses I know not that, but such a handkerchief pauses. I'm sure it was your wife's pause. So it's a pause for effect. Again, it's contrived. He doesn't need to pause, but he's doing it for credibility to convince Othello uh, that he's struggling to think of what to say next. He's pausing um, to, to kind of get his next words in, but he already knows what he's going to say. So we know that he knows what he's going to say, but the pauses are for Othello's benefit. And then we have here, either this is an interruption or he's overcome with emotion, can't finish his sentence. If it be that, and then we have a repetition between the two characters, Iago takes that line from Othello, if it be that. So the conditional is used, so the if, 
but it's not meant in that way. Iago repeats this in order to cement this idea in Othello's mind. Um, so he knows it's not an if, he knows that he's trying to suggest that it is that, that thing. But he repeats, he takes this line from Othello and he develops it further. Um, he, he, takes, he takes from Othello because Othello can't really lead this conversation. Iago is the one that wants to control what Othello is thinking, wants to control Othello's reactions, and he also controls Othello's language here by taking the line from him. Okay, so hopefully um, those examples did help you to understand how you can also do something similar yourself. These are all very generic skills, not just applicable to the Crucible and Othello. Um, regardless of what play you are studying, you will be able to go through. Um, have a look at the list that I provided at the beginning of this lesson. Have it somewhere in front of you when you're going through your play and just get, test yourself. Can you go for an extra? What can you pick out in terms of dialogue? Once you've identified something, then you've got to think about, well, what does this thing show me? What is it showing me about the characters, about their relationships, about their hierarchy, about what they're doing, about their feelings? And then think about why, why does the playwright do this? What am I supposed to understand? What am I supposed to learn? How am I supposed to feel? How am I supposed to react? So the final tips for talking about dialogue when studying a play. Dialogue reveals a lot. Do not overlook it. It's not just characters talking. It tells you a lot about relationships, status, hierarchy, emotions, the motivations of characters, particularly in the two examples we've looked at. All of those characters are driven by something. What they say, in most instances, is quite calculated, either to save themselves or to create a reaction in somebody else or to implant something in somebody else's mind. So there's always some reason there behind it. Dialogue also helps you to track changes and developments and then understand why they are significant and what they reveal. Do have a list of things with you. Put it on a post-it, put it in your play, have it on, on your notepad, have it in front of you and have it as part of a poster because once you've got this list in your head then you'll be more willing or more able to pick these out when you read through your play or even in an exam situation when you have to go through an extract for example. Always look for something that is revealing or significant. If you don't think you can say something about it, don't pick it, don't talk about it, there'll always be something else. And ask yourselves questions. Why here? Why is this particular pause here? Why is this question here? Why, why does he repeat here? Why does she use that word there? Why now at this point in the play? Why at this point in the act or scene? What does it show? What does it reveal? What am I supposed to understand? Always ask yourself the what, how, why questions. And always look back to what you already know. What do you know about the play, the characters, the act? Um, what do you know about the context? How does that help you? And um, what has already been established? If, if this is the beginning of a play, what is a playwright trying to establish? And then does that continue all the way through or does it change? So thank you very much for watching this video. I really hope that it has been helpful and I hope I've given you some tips that you can take away and implement yourself. And um, don't forget to look out for lesson three, which is where I help you to talk about sound effects within a play. Um, and if you haven't already, do check out lesson one, which helps you to talk about dialogue and stage directions together and to understand the relationship between them. Thank you very much. Goodbye.